So this lecture is primarily about contraceptive and contraceptive methods, um, but we'll touch a little bit on infertility and abortion as well. So when we talk about infertility, um, typically this is defined as the inability to um, develop a pregnancy after 12 months of actively um, pursuing those methods or um, not preventing those methods. So um, infertility is actually relatively common. It affects about 10 to 15 percent of reproductive age couples. Um, there are an enormous amount of factors that can uh, affect fertility. Um, everything from female factors, male factors, um, it could be childhood illnesses, for instance, uh, little boys that have mumps. Um, when they are a child, it can cause scrotal swelling and can actually cause permanent infertility issues. Um, so luckily we don't see mumps like we used to, so that's not as much of an issue. But the most common cause of infertility is actually obesity, um, one of those modifiable risk factors. So um, fat, I'm sorry, estrogen is a, a fat-based um, hormone or a fat-attracted hormone, I guess you would say. Um, so patients who have more adipose tissue um, are going to have more um, production of estrogen. And when that happens, that can cause us, um, more erratic um, ovul ovulations um, and periods resulting in inability to get pregnant or decreased ability to get pregnant. Um, usually the first thing they'll do though when assessing infertility is a semen analysis. They'll usually, it's easier to obtain, it's cheaper, and um, they can identify those causative factors that way. But we're not gonna really go into super details about infertility, um, but the most common factor is obesity. So when we're talking about management, again, we're not going into detail too much. Um, there are pharmacological as well as non-pharmacological methods. Um, the pharmacological methods and the the AD, ARTs, I'm sorry, assistive reproductive therapies are both listed in detail in your book. Um, we're not really going to go through the different assistive reproductive therapies. You could literally do a whole class um, or a whole semester just on those. There are so many different types of procedures. Um, an example, for instance, that most people have heard of is in vitro, um, where you take a egg and um, sperm and, and merge them together in an outside environment and then implant those into the woman and hope that um, some of them attach the uterus. But um, those are more extensive therapies. They are expensive. Insurance companies are just now starting to cover some of it. Um, so we'll probably see where they'll become more popular as that happens. Um, but medications, we are going to focus on one medication um, called clomiphene or clomid. Clomiphene is the most common reproductive drug that is used, and what it does is it stimulates the ovaries. So it tells the ovaries, hurry, wake up, come on, get to work, and has them start ovulating. So the problem with this is sometimes it can be a little too effective, so it can increase risk of multiples. But it does help increase the ovulation. So the big bulk of what we're going to talk about is contraception. So again, contraception is the intentional prevention of pregnancy. Um, and there's a couple things we'll talk about um, that are not really birth control methods, but sometimes can be used as birth control methods, although very, very ineffective. Um, so the first thing we have to do as nurses when we are taking care of patients looking at contraceptive methods is to figure out what would be the best method for that patient. Um, looking at the patient's overall knowledge level, what they already know about it, what they're comfortable with, um, past medical history, risk factors, all of these things should be taken into account to determine um, what is the best method that will suit their needs um, and be and create the least amount of risk. So when we're talking about, again, your family planning role, assessing that best method based on all of those factors. 
So first thing we'll talk about is natural family planning. Um, so natural family planning, there's a lot of things that fall under this. Basically, it is methods of self-assessment of, of a woman's physical characteristics to determine when she is ovulating. Um, and she'll take those fertility awareness methods and, and determine um, avoidance of intercourse during those, those fertile periods. Um, so... Abstinence is the only one that is 100% effective. All other methods of contraception have some degree of, of ineffectiveness. Um, going back to, I meant to mention, if you pull out that chart that is available to you week one, under week one content, there is a section on contraceptions. I would recommend using that as I go through these contraceptive methods um, to fill in the information. That way you can organize it and spread it out a little bit. So again, abstinence is the only one that's 100% effective. This is the avoidance of any sexual intercourse. Um, it is 100% effective for pregnancy as well as STI. So um, while it may not be a realistic method, um, it is um, the only one that is completely effective. Now, the two that I mentioned that are not truly contraceptive methods, a lot of times they are kind of... Uh, are not effective contraceptive methods, I should say, is coitus interruptus, or otherwise known as withdrawal, and breastfeeding. So withdrawal is about 25% effective. It is very, very, very ineffective. A lot of times it's more one of those oops, um, you think of something at the last second and, and realize you don't have a condom or anything to provide additional protection. So Coitus interruptus, again, not an adequate method. It does have the highest fail rate. Um, another one that's not truly a method, but sometimes people will use it, is breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is not a method of contraception. Um, it is your body's natural way of decreasing the risk of pregnancy. However, it, in order for breastfeeding to, to be effective, the baby has to be under six months of age. The mother has to have never had a period at that, never had a period since birth, I should say. Um, and they have to breastfeed around the clock every two to three hours all the time. If baby all of a sudden decides to sleep five hours one night, well, it's no, it, there it goes. It's not effective anymore. So um, even women who do this properly um, can still get pregnant. So it should never be condoned as a true method of contraception unless um, the, the person is willing to get pregnant, I guess you would say. So when we're talking about fertility awareness methods, these are, again, the ones where you take the physical characteristics and monitor them to see when they are most fertile and avoid intercourse during that time. Um, a lot of times people don't like natural family planning because it is a lot of work. Um, it's not just taking a pill or having an IUD. Um, you have to take your temperature and check your cervical mucus and all this stuff. So it is a lot of work. Um, it does have a lower rate of effectiveness compared to other methods. Um, but the reason natural family planning is good is it is good for everybody. People who can't tolerate other methods of birth control, like hormonal birth control, um, this is good for them. People under certain religions that don't believe in contraceptive methods, this is good for them as well. So this you will often see in, in various populations that can't use other um, more specific means of contraceptives. Um, so the, the four big ones are your basal body temperature. And what this is, is the woman checks her temperature in the morning, every morning before she gets out of bed, keeps a thermometer on her nightstand, checks her temperature. Um, when a woman is ovulating, your temperature will go up about a half a degree to a degree. Not much. You probably wouldn't notice if you weren't taking your temperature every day, but because they are, they'll see that increase and um, they will not have sexual intercourse during those few days around that. There's also cervical mucus where your cervical mucus actually gets 
thinner around the time you're ovulating because it allows the movement of sperm up the canal. Um, the calendar method, rhythm method, um, which is where you're counting based on when your menstrual cycle is, when your most fertile time is, so using the calendar. And Marquette, you've probably seen of it, you've probably just never heard the term. That's those ovulation predictors you see on TV that look just like pregnancy tests, but you use them to determine when you're ovulating. Um, these uh, can have some effectiveness to them. The, the problem with the calendar method is a woman has, excuse me, has to have regular periods every single month. So, and it doesn't have to be, it has to be 28 days. It just has to be regular for the woman. So you may have a woman who has a period every 27 days and that's okay. Um, as you can see from the picture though, if it's not regular, you can't count. And I, I mentioned in a previous lecture about reproductive concerns about how when we're, we're looking at contraception by the rhythm method, you're actually counting backwards, you're not counting forwards. So, so you your period starts 14 days after you ovulate. That can be difficult to determine. It, you can't go forward and think 14 days past that. So if you're not having regular periods, at that point, it's too late. Um, another reason this can be difficult, especially with the, the basal body temperature and, and cervical mucus, is um, the amount of time that sperm lives. So, so a an unfertilized egg only lives about 24 hours. And if it doesn't get fertilized, it gets excreted from the body. Sperm, however, can live three to five days in the vagina and in the uterus. So that means that if a woman had sex two or three days ago and then ovulates, well, guess what? They could still be in her system waiting. Um, so there, that increases that potential too because of the lifespan of sperm. So it is important for them to not just use, if they're going to use family planning, they should be using multiple methods, not just one to determine um, most reliably when their fertile time is. So let's talk more of, about barrier methods. So barrier methods are exactly what it sounds like. There's some kind of separation wall or whatnot between um, the, the vagina and the penis so that um, vaginal fluids and, and sperm cannot mix. Um, so when we're talking about barrier methods, it is recommended all barrier methods be used with a lubricant um, and a spermicide. So when I say lubricant, a lot of times people don't think about lubricants because a lot of these like condoms, for instance, are already pre-lubricated, uh, but they should have a lubricant. Um, if they aren't pre-lubricated, they should use a water-based lubricant because it um, can break down the latex if, um, if one is not used. So the different types, most people, when they think of a barrier method, they think of a condom. It is one of the most commonly used methods. It is easy to use, um, relatively inexpensive. Uh, you don't have to go to a doctor for it. They're over the counter, um, easy to obtain. Um, and effective, and um, they're when used properly, they're effective. Another thing that makes condoms great is they are one of the few th methods, other than abstinence, that will also prevent STIs or se sexually transmitted infections. So the other methods we talk about don't prevent sexually transmitted infections. Barrier methods, hormonal methods, none of those prevent STIs or the other barrier methods, I should say, but condoms will. Um, so people that are high risk. Um, People that, for instance, have multiple sex partners and things like that should be using a condom as well, even if they have other means of birth control. Um, then we have the diaphragm, cervical cap, sponge. You don't see those used too often, I feel like. Um, these are actually inserted up into the vagina. Um, they have to be inserted um, and let. they have to be left in place at least six hours. That is very important to know that these methods have to be left in place at least six hours. And the reason for this is if you pull out at one of those barrier devices right away, it's not going to contain all the sperm. They're just going to still be in the vagina and be able to bypass um, the cervix. Um, these methods all should be used, with, again, with a spermicide because spermicides um, will help slow down motility of sperm and, and cause them to die a little bit quicker. 
They don't actually kill like you think of like a pesticide, um, but they do slow motility so um, that those sperm die a little bit faster. So diaphragm cervical caps, they should definitely be left in place minimum six hours. Um, and they should not be put in any more than two hours prior to sexual intercourse. So it does take some planning on on the woman's part, um, but but it is a pretty effective method when it is used properly. It has about an 88, 89% effectiveness um, for the, the diaphragms and the cervical caps. Condoms are, are greater than 99%. So very effective when used properly. A lot of times um, barrier methods, though, are not used properly, um, which increases the risk of pregnancy. So here's an example of some pictures. This is what's called a female condom. Um, so this ring goes up against the cervix and then this ring kind of hangs out on the outside of the body. That's another thing you don't see used too often. Um, but this is an effective barrier method as well um, that can also help with sexually transmitted infections, just like the male condom. Um, this is actually a cervical cap, um, but a diaphragm looks relatively similar as far as it's like a cup that sits up against the cervix um, and then this is the sponge so another method is that and what a lot of people think of when they think of contraception is your hormonal methods um, there's oral contraceptives um, as well as injectables and things like that. So there's two broad categories. There's tons of different types on the market, tons of different brands, but two broad categories. You have your combined contraceptives, and these have estrogen and progesterone in them. And then you have your mini pill or progestin only. They only have progesterone. And the reason they're differentiated is for two reasons. One, the warning signs you see on the right hand of the screen is an AICS acronym. You need to know these warning signs. Um, these all, if you, if you read through them, they all kind of point to blood clots. So when you think of oral contraceptives, a lot of times that's what most people know, even if they don't know a lot about it, is blood clots, especially people who are over the age of 35, and especially if they are smokers, they te really should not be taking combined oral contraceptives contraceptives and the blood clots is related to the combined contraceptive so patients for instance that have a history of blood clots or patients who are smokers over the age of 35 patients who meet that high risk criteria um, should not be on the combined contraceptives or the estrogen it's the estrogen that causes that increased risk of blood clots Another group that should not take the combined one is women who are breastfeeding. Women who are breastfeeding should take progestin-only contraceptives. Um, so if it's the oral contraceptive, you'll often hear them called the mini pill. It's not because it's less effective. It's just because it only has one hormone instead of two. Um, your injectable progestin, like for instance, medroxyprogesterone or Depo-Provera, that is your injectable progesterone. Um, your implantable progesterones are coming back just in the last few years. Um, your Norplant, your Implanon, for instance. Um, where it's a rod that's inserted under the skin and the arm, um, releasing um, progesterone. Um, so with women who are breastfeeding, um, if they take the combined estrogen progesterone contraceptive, it can greatly decrease their, their milk production. Um, so women who are breastfeeding should only take progesterone contraceptives. So going back to the combined one, we have oral contraceptives, and those are the ones you worry about with the warning signs, the blood clots. Um, combined estrogen progesterone contraceptives are the ones associated with blood clots. The warning signs you see on the right-hand side, that is your combined contraceptives. Know those warning signs. Um, so we have oral, we have transdermal, which is a patch. Um, so this patch is, um, it, you get a pack of three patches when the, um, for a monthly dose. They apply a new patch each week, take the old patch off after three applications three weeks take the patches off and go a week without a patch um, to where they have their period 
The vaginal ring also is intended to be used. Um, the Nuva ring is what you'll hear it called, also intended to be used for three weeks. Um, the difference is it's only one ring. So instead of replacing it every week, um, you, it only it stays in for three weeks and then gets replaced. But the biggest difference in the estrogen progesterone and the progesterone only is breastfeeding as well as the increased risk of complications related to blood clots with the combined. None of these provide any kind of STI protection, um, so women should be made aware of that, um, especially if you have women who are um, high risk, um, whether it be uh, because they uh, have multiple sexual partners or whatever, that they should, they should know um, that methods other than the barrier methods do not provide STI protection. So the next, which is also, it, it's kind of a, Foreign body slash hormonal method is the intrauterine device. Um, so it's if you look at the picture on your right hand side, that's the actual size of it. Um, it's a little plastic or copper. They have copper ones as well. Um, and it's inserted into the uterus, just like you see on the left-hand side. Um, so it acts almost like a foreign body um, where it prevents the egg from the fertilized egg from attaching to the uterine wall. It also works by releasing amounts of hormones over a period of time um, to prevent ovulation as well. So it has a, a dual um, purpose. So this also does not produce any kind of means of STI protection. And in fact, it is contraindicated for people who are very high risk, um, whether it be they have a lot of sexual partners or if they have a history of pelvic inflammatory disease. If a woman has had pelvic inflammatory disease in the past, she has a much higher risk of developing that again. Um, and if she has a foreign body in her uterus, having that foreign body increases that risk. Um, so they should not um, have one if they have a history of pelvic inflammatory disease or patients that are just high risk in general because of that risk of uh, pelvic inflammatory disease developing. So one thing you should teach patients is to feel for the strings. You can see in the picture on the left-hand side, there's two strings that look about the size of fishing line that hang down into the vagina. Women should be instructed to check those strings once a month to make sure they're still there, to check for length, make sure it's not changing. Um, if it feels like it's getting longer or shorter, or if you can't find them, it could be a sign that the IUD has migrated. Um, so those strings should be checked um, once a month um, to make sure they're still in place. Um, a common symptom right after IUD insertion is cramping, and it can be pretty intense cramping too, um, and oftentimes a little bit of bleeding. Um, it, patients should understand that this is normal for a couple of days. Um, if they are having cramping or bleeding after that that's not associated with a period, it should be investigated because it could be a sign that um, it has perforated, for instance. Um, they also need to report if they're having any foul discharge, if they have fever, um, anything like that, then um, that could be a sign of a uh, infection, an intrauterine infection. Um, but cramping is common, but only for the first couple of days. So one method that um, many people think of is an abortion is plan B or emergency contraception. This is not an abortion. This is not an intentional forced loss of a pregnancy. So what this is, is it, it has to be taken within 72 hours of unplanned intercourse um, or potential any intercourse that could be a potential unplanned pregnancy. Um, so what this does is it prevents the uterus, it makes the uterus extra excitable, I guess you would say, and keeps that, if an egg gets fertilized, it keeps it from attaching to the wall. So just like your body would naturally do. It's not killing a fetus, um, it just prevents implantation. Um, so the most common ones you see is there's two prescription oral medications. Um, there's Ella, 
or I'm sorry, there's two oral medications. One is a prescription, which is Ella. So Ella is, um, you do have to have a prescription for, um, which can make it, it does last a little bit longer. It can last up to five days. Um, but sometimes if you, it's hard to get into your doctor or if you have a teenager or somebody like that, um, who is not, um, wanting to, who is embarrassed or, or not willing to go to the doctor, it, it can be, um, a little bit more difficult, which now they have behind the counter medications where you don't need a prescription. Um, you go to the pharmacist and they are able to, um, administer that medication to you. Um, and these are your progestin only pills. Um, and those can help because they are readily available. You don't need a prescription for, um, the third option is a copper IUD. Um, so if it's put in within the first few days after unplanned intercourse, um, it can prevent that egg from implanting into the wall and then you can leave it in for 10 years. Um, copper IUDs last a little bit longer than the Mirena, typically the Mirena right now, although they are quite, there's a big study that was just recently done in Italy. Um, so we'll start seeing that done in the U.S. They're starting to trial it in the U.S. as well um, of extending the effectiveness of Mirena out to seven years um, and so far it's looked good uh, but as of right now it's used for five years um, but the, the copper IUD you can use for 10 years, um, which is nice because um, then you, you have it inserted. It helps with potentially preventing an unplanned pregnancy, but then it's not um, short term. You can continue to use it. So those are all temporary methods that we talked about. They're, they're um, can be removed um, and reversed. Um, sterilization is permanent contraception. An important thing to note with sterilization, there is no STI protection with sterilization. It is also not 100% effective. It is very effective, but not 100% effective. So it's important to teach patients, one, there is a small risk of getting pregnant, um, and two, that there is no STI protection for that. So they need to use some other means if they are in a situation of potential STI exposure. So when we're talking about females, typically it's called pubal ligation. When we're talking about males, it's called a vasectomy. Um, so there's two different ways they do females. Um, they can do the tubal reconstruction. I mean, I'm sorry, the tubal um, where they cut, tie, and block um, the tubes, um, which is how they used to do it. They would burn the ends. Um, they're completely separated. Um, nowadays, they're doing more what's called tubal occlusion, which is where they put what looks like a small spring in the fallopian tube. And that foreign body being in there creates scar tissue around it, and the scar tissue blocks the tube. Um, it's shown to be very effective. The problem with the tubal occlusion is it does not work right away. It takes about two to three months because scar tissue doesn't form right away. Um, the cut tie, um, the cutting and tying type of situation where it's completely cut apart um, is effective right away. A male vasectomy where they actually cut the, the epididymis um, and separate them and tie them off. That also takes three months or about 20 ejaculations before it's effective because um, sperm, even though the scrotum is it's separated and the sperm that's in the scrotum can't get there, it's still being stored in the vas deferens. So um, it is still have the potential to get pregnant just because the procedure has been done doesn't mean that the man is sterile. Typically, they recommend that they come back in for a semen analysis about three months afterwards to make sure truly that um, there is no sperm in the semen that they're ejaculating. So Follow-up sperm count is super important. So when we're talking about abortion, we're going to talk about with pregnancy spontaneous abortion. Spontaneous abortion is a, it, otherwise known as a miscarriage, an unintentional loss of pregnancy. We're going to talk briefly about intentional loss of pregnancy. This is before 20 weeks. Um, it can be elective or it can be therapeutic, like for instance, in cases where the um, continuing with the pregnancy threatens the mother's life. Um, so 
most places um, don't allow second trimester abortions, um, or it has to be very early. Um, most of the time, abortions are going to be first trimester, and they can either be done surgically, um, which is what most people think of, also known as an aspiration abortion, or, or medical. Usually medical, though, has to be less than like six to eight weeks of um, gestation. And the medications you see are listed. The most common group of medications they use is called methotrexate and misoprostol. So methotrexate you've probably heard of because it is a drug that's used for a lot of different things. Most of the time when you think of methotrexate, you think of it as a chemotherapy drug, but it is used in a wide variety of autoimmune disorders, for instance, as well as abortions. It acts as a feticide in this case. It actually is the drug that kills the fetus. The misoprostol encourages um, uterine contractions. So what the misoprostol does is it makes the uterus contract and push out that abortion. So complications of abortion include that patients should be taught. Um, they can easily get an infection. Um, they can have retained products of conception, which means that they could have um, uncontrolled bleeding or infection as well. Um, so the biggest thing is knowing what drugs are used um, and, and monitoring for those post effects.